season. Well, today is a huge day in the fact, um, and, I'll, and I'll share a few things here in a few moments as it relates to why it's so huge. But it's also big in the sense that it officially kind of launches all that we are expectant for for the rest of this year and really for this fall. And we've been in a series, um, and many of you who've been a part of this now for several weeks, it's called Time to Stand. And one of the things that we wanted to do really was to kind of go into um, this fall season, really just putting our focus on God through this aspect of understanding not only what worship is, but how we can live a lifestyle of worship. And I just thought it would be fitting for us to kind of put the exclamation point, if you will, on our 21-day prayer journey that we had. And that was truly an incredible experience as we just pressed in for 21 consecutive days and just asking God for more of His favor, you know, more of His, of His influence, more of His power, more of His protection over our lives. And I love what the prayer of Jabez says, and God granted His request. And so we, that's what we've been doing. We've just been praying, just been asking God to do what only He can do and to prepare our hearts so that we're ready to receive what it is that God wants to do in us and through us. And so over the last few weeks as we've been in this series called Time to Stand, we've been really even learning specifically what it means to win the war for our worship. And so it's important that we realize that we are in a spiritual battle. We do have an adversary, an enemy, that's out to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to rob you of everything that God has in store for you. And, you know, when we think about the war for our worship, whether we realize it or not, every single day is a battle. Because the enemy, the, the Bible says, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He's always trying to throw confusion, distractions. He'll do anything and everything he can to take your focus off of God and put it on yourself, put it on other things, put it on ultimately on the things that really don't matter at the end of the day because that's what the enemy wants. He wants us to get diverted. He wants us to be distracted. So the last thing in our minds is worshiping God for who he is and what he means for our lives. And so I want to begin today really with the question that we began this series with. And here's the question. Are you ready? Are you ready? All right. What is the one thing that God desires above all else that only you can give? It's our worship. More than anything else, that is what God longs for. It's, it's what he desires. He wants our worship. And you say, well, well, what is worship? Well, as we've defined Worship is our response back to God. It's our response to God's love that he has for you and for me. And we have to understand that we were made, we were created for worship. God made us for his pleasure, for his purposes, for his glory. We are created in the very image of God. And we need to understand that God made us so that he could love us, so he could know us. And more than anything, what God longs for is that we love him back and we know him back. Because that is what worship is all about. It is our response to God's love that he has already demonstrated to us. And so therefore, as we respond back with our fixed attention and our focus on God, when we give him our time, when we give him our, our abilities, our gifts, our talents, when we give him our treasure, listen, when we give him our heart, our focus, our focused attention and affection, anything and everything we give back to God is an expression of our love and our gratitude and our thanksgiving because of his great mercy, because of what he truly means to us. And that is the reason why there is a war for our worship, because that's the last thing the devil wants. He doesn't want you or I to give our undivided focused attention and allegiance to the Lord. He would much rather us give our undivided time and attention and allegiance to the things of this world. And that's the reason why when we dedicate our lives to God, and we live a lifestyle of worship in our response back to him. Guess what? It puts a smile on 
God's face. Turn to your neighbor and say, let's make God smile today. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to learn how to make God smile today. Now, you don't want anybody, you, no, nobody wants God to frown, especially on you, right? No, 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 no. We want God to smile on our lives. We want to put a smile on the face of God. And what's awesome is that anytime we worship God, that's what we're doing. We are putting a smile on the face of God. Why? Because our worship is what brings pleasure to God. And we're going to look through God's word today. We're going to specifically, we're going to look for a few moments on one man. His name was Noah. How many of you heard of Noah before? Well, Noah is not just some fictitious, make-believe character. He was one of the very first individuals that God really put the spotlight on to serve as an example because of the way that he lived. And what's interesting about the days of Noah, it's very, very similar to the days in which we're living today. Because Noah lived during a time shortly after creation, and obviously there was a population explosion, and man, people were everywhere, but unfortunately, rather than people worshiping God and living for God, they began to worship themselves. They began to worship the creation rather than the creator, and as a result, spiritually and morally the people of the world became spiritually and morally bankrupt and as a result what's interesting is that in Genesis chapter 6 verse 8 it says but Noah was a pleasure to the Lord in the NLT it says but Noah found favor with the Lord of all the people on planet earth at that moment when God searched the entire world there was only one human being left and God says that's the guy that's the one who puts a smile on my face why because of the life that Noah lived one of the things that we learn is simply because Noah the Bible says was a pleasure To the Lord. It's interesting is that the people whom God created so that he could love them, so that he could know them, so that they could love him back and know him in a real intimate way, the way God had originally planned and intended. Well, instead, they chose to go their own way. They choose a life of sin and ultimately death. They choose to live a life of selfish pleasure and immorality and rebellion towards God. And yet God said, because of a broken heart, he said, I'm going to wipe out the earth. Everything that I wanted and longed for, everything that I created, I'm going to wipe it out except for one person who will remain. You say, well, why did God decide to wipe out the earth? Was it because God made a mistake? No, God doesn't make mistakes. The Bible says that God grieved over mankind because of the choices that they made. It's kind of like this. It's like, a, it's like a, a parent who has a wayward child who's living outside the will of God, who's living a, a life of defiance, a rebellion, who's chosen their way rather than God's way. And as a result, as a parent, what happens? Your heart is broken. Your heart grieves. Your heart longs for your son or your your daughter to come back into a right relationship with God as well as with yourself. And that's exactly what God was doing. He was grieving over the lostness and over the depravity and the choices that people made. They brought sin and death upon themselves because of their wickedness. And yet when God saw Noah, he said, this one brings pleasure to me. This one is what puts a smile on my face. So today, quickly, we're going to just learn four things that I think is important for us when it comes to how we can put a smile on the face of God. And the first is this, if you're taking notes, is when we love him. We make God smile when we love God back. It says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, it says, Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless man living on earth at the time. He consistently followed God's will, 
and enjoyed a close relationship with him. Was Noah perfect? Absolutely not. But at the same time, as we see, Noah's heart was 100% yielded, committed to serving and walking with God on a daily, consistent basis. And that's how we build a relationship with God. You build a relationship with God, you get to know God, and you express your love back to God by what? By spending time with Him. And it's so important that we understand the, just every single day, it is the consistency of our lives. It's the consistency of our focused attention. It's the consistency of spending time in God's Word. It's God's love letter to us. And so when we read God's Word and we receive the revelation that God wants to show us and to teach us and to help us to understand, when we spend time in His Word and we spend time in prayer, listen, God speaks to us through His Word. We speak to God through prayer. And as a result, there is communication. There is a connection. And there is a relationship. There's intimacy intimacy because of the love relationship that you have for one another and that's what God longs for he wants us to love him I love what second chronicles 16 verse 9 says it says that God searches the whole earth looking for somebody whose hearts are completely yielded to him you know I've learned in my short life I've learned that you are or you ultimately will become what you're committed to. So it's an important question that we ask ourselves. What are, what are we committed to? Because whatever it is we're committed to is what we are eventually going to become. So here's, a, here's an important question that you may want to think about as it relates to whether or not you truly love God. What are you committed to? You say, well, I'm committed to a lot of things. Well, be more specific. Look at your calendar. Look at all the commitments that you have. In other words, look at all the things that you've said yes to in your life. And how many of those things that you've said yes to that has now become a commitment in your life, how many of those things, commitments that you said yes to is now competing for your time, your allegiance, your focused attention, your affection, everything you have? How much of that is competing between you and God? God is a jealous God. And He wants nothing more than for our hearts to be fully committed to Him. Another question is, uh, who are you committed to? So think about that. God wants us to be committed to him. He wants us more than anything to live our lives because he is our audience of one. Amen? So sometimes we have to say no to the good things so we can say yes to the best things. And that's just being with God. It's prioritizing our relationship with him. Number two, the second thing that puts a smile on God's face is not only when I love him, but ultimately when we trust him. What's interesting is that Noah not only loved God, he brought pleasure to God. Because he was the only righteous man living at the time. But here's the thing, he trusted God he fulfilled a call and an assignment that God placed upon his life. Listen to this, even when it did not make sense. So let me just share it with you this way in Hebrews 11, verse 7. In the hall of faith, you ought to read Hebrews 11 on your own time, it's incredible. By faith, the Bible says, Noah built a ship in the middle of dry land. He was warned about something he couldn't see and acted on what he was told. And as a result, Noah became intimate with God. I love that. So imagine this scene for just a moment. Imagine God telling Noah what he's about to do. So basically God says, hey Noah, I'm getting ready to obliterate. I'm getting ready to wipe out every human being on the face of the planet. I'm taking out all of the animals except for you and your family. I'm choosing you to be the guy that I'm going to start this whole thing over again. Can you imagine Noah going home to his wife and kids and saying, uh, you're never going to believe this. <laughs> I got a text today <laughs> from God. 
and he just let me know like like things are getting ready to go down. I mean, the whole place is completely going to be wiped out and destroyed, but hey, he chose us, I mean, like us right here, to be the people that he's going to like start the whole thing all over again with. I mean, can you imagine how bizarre that must have been in Noah's eyes, and yet at the same time, he did it anyway out of a heart of obedience. Why? He did it out of the fact that he loved God, even to the point of obeying God when it didn't even make sense. So there's some things that we got to realize. There are three, I think, legitimate arguments you could make or legitimate reasons or excuses that Noah could have given God after God gave him the assignment. For example, he could have said, um, well, okay, God, you said that you're going to wipe out the earth. Okay, I, I, I get that. Yeah, people are really bad, doing a lot of crazy bad stuff. And, okay, now you say you're going to um, flood the earth. Okay, I'm not sure exactly what that means because I've never even seen rain before. You can't have a flood without rain, right? Well, Noah had never even seen rain. The people had never seen rain before. And not only that, listen to this. God told Noah to build a boat literally hundreds and hundreds of miles away from the closest ocean. So not only had Noah never seen rain before, God tells Noah to build a boat in the middle of nowhere on dry land hundreds of miles from the nearest ocean. So those are two legitimate excuses that Noah could have given God in this uh, assignment that God was giving him. And not only that, the third excuse that I think is pretty legit is Noah could have said, okay, I, 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 okay let, me, let, me, let me just try to uh, wrap my mind around this. So, you, so God, you're saying that you want me to, um, okay, it's going to flood Whatever that means, okay, whatever rain looks like, okay, okay, I'll figure it out. All right, now I'm going to build this boat over here, out here, and nowhere on dry land. And uh, I don't know how this is going to work, but I'm, okay, I'm going to do this. But now you want me to do what? You want me to get all of the animals and the insects, and, 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 and you, you want me to gather them together. And round them up, and put them on this boat to take care of them? And th that's exactly what you're asking me to do. I mean, think, put yourself in Noah's sandals, okay? Noah was given an assignment by God. And even though he didn't see it, he couldn't understand it, it I mean, his mind, I'm sure, was totally blown. And yet at the same time, the Bible says that Noah trusted God even when it didn't make sense. Noah didn't complain. Noah didn't make excuses. He said, God, if that's what you desire, I'm going to trust you that you know best. And here's the question. How many of you believe in God? Let me see your hands. How many of you believe in God? You probably wouldn't be in church today if you didn't believe in God. But here's even an even more important question. Everybody, if you ask them on the street, how many of you believe in God, they'll probably raise their hand. But here's the more important question is, it's one thing to believe in God, it's another thing to believe God. And there are a lot of people who aren't willing to quite go there. Because they need some more blanks to be filled in. They need some more answers to questions they have. They need somebody to kind of connect the dots for them, maybe intellectually or, or with all these, you know, doubts or, you know, the skepticism. They might. Hey, fine. At the end of the day, Noah said, hey, God, if this is what you are asking me to do, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to believe that you are who you say you are and you will do what you have promised you will do. You know what that's called? That is called trust and that is called faith. And that's what God wants. He wants that from us. That's why Proverbs 3 says, trust in the Lord with all of Before you say, okay, now I believe. No, 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 no. It is believing God even when it doesn't make sense. Not leaning on our own understanding, but in all of our ways acknowledging Him. And He will guide and direct our steps. 
That's what God promises. So the question is, are we willing to love him? And are we willing to trust him? Noah trusted God. And here is a (laughs) million dollar question I have for you. You ready for this? How many of you would be willing to trust God for whatever it is or whatever it was that he was asking you to do, knowing in advance it would take 120 years? Because that's exactly how long it took Noah to wait. So in this time, God gave him an assignment, and in this season of preparation God said hey I want you to build this boat you got to go round up all the animals and then I want you just to wait well you can imagine 120 stinking years that's a long a long time right that's more than a lifetime and yet that's the point God is saying it doesn't matter how long it might take the question is are you willing to trust me are you willing to put your faith and complete trust that I am Who I say I am. That I will do what I promise that I will do. Are you willing to trust me when it doesn't make sense? Even if it takes the rest of your life and you see no results. That's exactly what Noah did. Maybe you're here today and you've been in that season of waiting. And the question is, are you going to continue to trust? Are you going to continue to believe God for that medical breakthrough? Are you going to continue to believe God and trust that God is going to make a provision and make a way where there doesn't seem to be a way? Are you willing to wait on God for God to open doors to give you the desires of your heart, to to see a dream realized, to see a relationship restored, to, to see opportunities open for your life? Are you willing to wait on God even when it doesn't make sense because that's exactly what Noah did it's exactly what we did 22 years ago when God allowed us to start a church in a little spot called Lake Nona because that's all it was it was a little spot there was nothing here I mean, nothing that you know or equate or associate with Lake Nona is what it was 22 years ago. And we started, and after nine months, we left Lake Nona because we realized we were way ahead of the growth curve, and it was very difficult, and we were trying to get people from all over the city to come to a place they'd never really even heard of. And so we ended up moving at seven different locations. Are you with me? Seven different times of starting stopping, relaunching seven different times, never having a place of our own, always renting, always in situations where we were at the mercy of a landlord or at the mercy of other situations or circumstances, eventually came back full circle, came to Lake Nona, went all in to build our future, COVID happened, no church for a year. I mean, it was like, God, what the heck? And I'm thinking to myself, 22 years, man, that's nothing compared to 120 years. And at the end of the day, it's still believing, it's still trusting. And Hebrews 11:6 6 says it this way, And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who are willing to earnestly seek Him. Don't give up on your dreams. Don't give up on that, that, that prayer that you're praying for, that, that breakthrough that you're believing God for. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Don't quit during the dip. Don't quit when life gets hard. Don't quit when there doesn't appear to be a way. Don't quit on God because God never quits on us. Noah faced discouragement, criticism, rejection, embarrassment, and yet Noah kept believing and kept trusting. No wonder he put a smile on the face of God. Because he loved him and he trusted him. And when you love God with all your heart and you trust him with everything you have and everything that you are, I'm telling you, it brings pleasure to God. But the third thing we learn is this. 
that we put a smile on the face of God when we obey him. In Genesis 6, verse 22, it says, So Noah did everything. Turn to your neighbor and say everything. everything. Noah did everything, not some of the things, not a few of the things, or the things that he personally liked, or the things that he enjoyed, or the things that he was most passionate about. No, he did everything exactly as God had commanded him. It's kind of like what David said, the psalmist in one, Psalm 119, verse 33. Just tell me what to do and I will do it, Lord. As long as I live, I will wholeheartedly obey. Kind of re- reminds me of the pastor uh, who was new to this church. And this guy approached him. And uh, the pastor is out at the front door shaking hands as people were leaving. This guy approached him and literally stuck out his hand, shook the pastor's hand, and he said, Pastor, nice to meet you. He said, the answer is yes. Now what's the question? And the guy just walked off. Kind of left the pastor hanging like, what in the world just happened? Who is that guy? Very next Sunday, exact same thing. After the service, pastor goes out shaking hands. Dude walks by. Shook the pastor's hand. He said, Pastor, just want you to know, the answer is yes. Now what's the question? The guy just bolted, just walked off. Pastor's like, man, this has got a few short fries from a Happy Meal or something. I don't know what's going on with this dude. The guy's a little off. Third Sunday comes by. The dude comes up to the pastor once again. Said, Pastor, I just want you to know the answer is yes. Now what is the question? And the dude bolted. So the pastor, he started looking up who this guy was, asking people in the church, like, hey, do y'all know who this guy is? Like, is he, is he okay? I mean, is this elevator going all the way up? I mean, like, what, what is going on here with this guy? He keeps coming up to me, and, man, he shakes my hand and says, pastor, he answers yes. Now what's the question? And then he just leaves, leaves me hanging. So the pastor finally got the guy's contact information, called him up. So, man, I'd like just for us to hook up and have a cup of coffee and get to know each other. They meet up at a coffee shop, and the pastor said, uh, I'm really confused. He said, for the last several weeks, you've been approaching me and asking me, you know, he, he, he said, you, you keep saying the word, the answer is yes, and then you follow up by saying, now what's the question? I said, I'm just, could you help me understand exactly, like, where you're coming from, what you mean by all that? And all of a sudden, the guy, tears began to well up in his eyes. He said, pastor, he said, you have no idea. He said, the life that I used to live. The addiction that I was enslaved to for so many years. He said, when Jesus radically changed my life and set me free. When I realized all that Jesus did on the cross for me. And he was willing to forgive me of every single thing that I had ever done. When Jesus came into my life and he saved me. He forgave me. He changed me. And he set me free. He said I made a decision when I put my faith in Jesus. That from that point moving forward. He was going to posture his life to say God whatever it is you want me to do. The answer is yes. Now what is that assignment? And the question is, are we willing to do the same? Even when it doesn't make sense, are we willing to obey God because we're willing to trust Him, because we love Him, because of His great mercy? That's why. I was pulled over yesterday by a police officer. I was on my way to a funeral. And I was going to the funeral rather quickly. Because I was running late. Misjudged my time. And I'm going down. I I hadn't hardly left my house. I'm cruising down this country road. And all of a sudden I see this pickup truck coming the opposite direction. And I had a feeling it was a police officer. And all of a sudden the lights went on. And I'm like, oh. And I literally just pulled off to the side. I knew, man, I I was busted. Guy made a U-turn, had his lights on, got out. I already had my, my, had my driver's license like out the window. And he said, uh, sir, he said, he said, do you know how fast you were going? I said, I have no idea. He said, let me tell you specifically. He said, you were going 62 in a 45 mile an hour speed zone. I said, listen, I'm not even going to argue, not even question. I said, I am guilty. 100% my fault. 
He said, where are you going? What you, why are you in such a hurry? I said, I know you may not believe this. I said, I'm a pastor. <laughs> As if that gave me a little clout, you know. He goes, I'm a pastor. I, say, I said, I'm a pastor. And I, I had, literally was wearing a black suit, black tie, going to a funeral. He said, uh, so, so why are you in such a hurry? I said, well, I'm going to a funeral. I said, not only that, I said, I'm the one who's officiating the funeral. He said, well, he said, this is your lucky day. He said, where's the funeral at? I said, it's off of Highway 50 on the east side of town. He looked at his watch. I, he said, what time are you supposed to be there? I told him, and here's what he said. He said, well, I'm going to let you off the hook today. He said, but I need you to do me a favor. He said, you need to slow down, he said, or somebody's going to be preaching your funeral. I said, yes, sir. I said, thank you very much. Took off, and I said, God, thank you. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Aren't you thankful that we serve a God who lets us off the hook? Aren't you thankful because of what Jesus did over 2,000 years ago that we acknowledge through our communion today that we simply said, God, thank you because of your great mercy. I am, I am not what I ought to be. I'm not what I should be, could be. But God, because of Jesus Christ, I'm not what I used to be. Because of your great mercy. That's why we love him. That's why we trust him. And that is why we obey him. And when we love him, and when we trust him, and we obey him with all of our hearts, we can't help. Listen, we can't help but do the last thing that puts a smile on the face of God. And that is when we praise and we thank him, it makes God smile. It makes God smile. So in Genesis 8, verse 20, it says, but then Noah, and this is after the, the flood had come and gone. And after you remember the story and God, God restored Noah and those on the ark and you know, he sent the dove back and released it multiple times, eventually came back. And this time, it was evident when the olive branch, little olive leaf or branch, the dove had, it, it, it was that reminder that, you know what, there was dry ground. And when the dove never came back, it was the fulfilled promise that, you know what, God is who he says he is. He will do what he says he will do. And Noah built an altar, the Bible says, and sacrificed burnt offerings on it. Because of his great mercies, Romans 12, 1 says, we are to present our bodies, we are to present our lives as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him. What is worship? Worship is our response. And when we love God back, when we trust him, when we obey him, and we give praise and we give thanks back to him for who he is and all that he means to our lives and all that he has done, we are to present ourselves as a living sacrifice to him. So therefore, when we give our time, when we give our talents, when we give our treasure, those are just expressions of our way of saying, God, thank you. God, thank you. I'm presenting my life as a sacrifice for an audience of one. So today, we're going to stand, we're going to worship, and we're going to thank the Lord. But before you stand, I'm going to give you something worthy of standing about. Apart from what Jesus has done for us, we're going to give glory to God because we have raised the needed cash. We have raised the needed cash to close on 4.7 acres of land. And by God's glory, 
to his glory and through the people of God, meaning all of you, we've taken the two fish and we've taken the five loaves and we have given it into the hands of God and he has blessed it and he has multiplied it to the point where we have enough. We have enough. And it is our prayer that by the end of this month, there will be a sign on Narcusi Road that will say the future home of Rethink Life. Over 50,000 cars a day pass by that location. And that is going to be the place where lives are going to be changed. Marriages will be put back together. Families will be restored. The lost will be found. And all glory will be given to God. Because generation after generation after generation will say, Only God could do what he has done. So let's stand to our feet and let's worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords as our team leads us today. Because he is worthy of our praise. He's worthy of all the glory for who he is and all that he means to our lives. So today, I'm going to ask that no one leave, slip out. Even our volunteers, our dream team, I just want you to take in this moment. Let's lift our voices. Let's worship as our response to praise and thanksgiving for all that God has done. We give you glory, God.